this is Everyday Expertise, and I'm Angela, and I'm here today with Steve Ellis. He's an illustrator, comic artist, author, and teacher who has worked in the entertainment industry for nearly 25 years. Hello! Hi, how you doing? So, how did you get started in art? Wow, uh, okay, so probably when I was, well, when I was a little kid, I just basically drew all the time, and my, uh, my brother and my sister both were kind of into drawing as well so i kind of followed in there you know watched them what they were doing and then i kind of went from there but um <clears throat> but yeah that i mean that was and basically when i was like in fifth or sixth grade i started meeting kids who were interested in comic books and started just drawing my own from that from that point on hmm. what are your preferred mediums oh wow uh well i'm really i really enjoy pen and ink um, and then for paint, I end up using acrylic a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like using digital, but I find, um, the feel of having real material, uh, is just really nice to have the actual material in the, in the, you know, actually working on the paper and the textures are really nice. So mm -hmm. I like using acrylic and watercolor, uh, for color. That's cool. Uh, what are your major influences? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's a long list. Uh, probably when I was younger, I would have said someone like um, uh, Bernie Wrightson and Brom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's weird because my stuff has gotten so much more like, what do you call it? Uh, clean and simple and cartoony and less horror-y as I've gone along. Not that, that I still don't do the horror stuff. It's just that I've been doing like, you know, Only Living Girls a lot less uh, scary. So probably, you know, um, hmm. Other than like those guys, probably, you know, just just seeing a lot of the stuff that I see from um, like young adult books, uh, story wise and things like mm. that, that. You know, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about that more because there's a lot of there's a lot of different. I, I look at a lot of art uh, all the time. So like from a painting standpoint, um, you know, there's a bunch of people who I know who are like, you know who've been around like you know, obviously like people like Frazetta but NC Wyeth uh I like the way that they put the paint down thick so when I put my acrylic paint down I tend to put it on fairly mm. heavy. um stuff like that for the inking you know um I would say Bernie Wrightson and uh, any number of like Wally Wood any number of old school comic book illustrators mm. Do you do, uh, do you do your penciling, your inking and your coloring yourself? Yeah, uh, I do. Um, I mean, for the most part, I've been lately, I've been using, I've been having some other people help me out with the colors, uh, but I still end up kind of going in and kind of tweaking it out anyway. Mm. Um, I don't know why that is. I guess I'm just a control freak, but, <laughs> um, I guess it, it's also that I, when I pencil stuff, I already know how I want to ink it. So I haven't. Mm. I don't fully pencil it anymore. And then when I'm inking it, I'm already thinking about what the colors I want. You know, so it's like, it's already in my head, like, okay, this is, I already know kind of where I'm going with it. So to have, to hand that to someone else and be like, well, this is all what's in my head here. I, I don't know how to do that really well. So I end up kind of, you know, spending a whole time doing my own work, like from beginning to end. Yeah, it's interesting because it's not, it's not usual, I think, for comic artists still. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, I mean, a lot of the comic book artist, like, thing has been because, of, you know, the way that, you know, being broken down to pencil or ink or colorist was basically for convenience so that, mm -hmm. you know, back in the, you know, back in the day, one penciler could pencil, you know, eight books and hand them off to, you know, numerous inkers who would then ink those books. And then, you know, and, and coloring was a heck of a lot more uh, difficult a task back then mm. um, because you didn't even, I mean, a lot of people didn't even actually see the colors until they were printed uh, because mm. you were putting numbers in. Oh the, yeah. So there was really, I mean, so, I mean, sometimes they would do like color comps and then number them, but there was no, like, there was no, uh, you wouldn't ever, you know, there was no reproduction of the actual art that you saw. So now like the computer just makes it so much easier to be able to like, you know, scan it in, you know, and then immediately get on the coloring. And lately, 
uh, with the most recent book, I've been using the iPad a lot, um, mm -hmm. doing a lot of the, the inking even on the, and the penciling and inking even directly on that, which is, it's more, it was supposed to be for expedience sake, but um, I'm taking just as long. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Well, then the, I think that sort of brings me to then uh, process. Mm -hmm. This show is very much about process. Can you walk me through the process um, of making, say, one of your your comics from, uh, you know, idea, sort of the the start when you got when you are creating uh, to the, the finished sort of issue or or pages sure. or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so. so um... Well, lately I've been working with David Gallagher mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, for, for quite a while. Um, and so when we're working together, we tend to have kind of like uh, brainstorming meetings um, where we'll sit down and kind of shoot out ideas for the, where we want the characters to go, how the story points should be, you know, what what things should happen in the story, different, you know, characters. There's a lot of different kind of alien races in The Only Living Boy and The Only Living Girl. And so, like, we... We tend to put, uh, you know, I t we tend to design all that stuff early on, or at least begin that process. And then what happens is we basically kind of compile a lot of crazy ideas. And then we start to, uh, as we go, we kind of build the story from there. Um, David tends to take reins on kind of organizing everything into a script. And then... You know, he'll send me what you know, he'll send me a script and he's he's been getting more like at times depending on where which which book we were working on and depending on what uh what process we were we were doing sometimes we would just talk through pages mm. and just draw them as we talked them out uh, and he would dialogue them later um other times we would just lay out the books together we don't live in the same town anymore so it's not quite that easy so he'll write more of a complete script and then I take that and I basically, um, you know, so, so the script that he writes tends to have, you know, a uh, page and number, uh, panel um, breakdowns. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, everything happens in each panel. And um, I'll, I'll usually look through it and pretty stick pretty close to what he's done. If, if I'm changing things, it's usually like we could do that in one panel rather than two panels or whatever, uh, because we've already gone over the story. A lot of it's just kind of like pacing things out. And sometimes I'll add some panels here, take away panels there, or change the focus of a page. Um, but then basically my step from there is to to loosely uh, thumbnail out my pages. And I'm not, for some reason in my conceptual stage, I'm not really good at like having like a nice little thumbnail. Like my friend Dean Haspiel has like these beautiful little like, like thumbnail pages where like, 50 different thumbnails on one page and I end up having these scribbles all over the place, all on different <laughs> sheets of paper. And then I scan them all in and then I kind of set up a template on Photoshop and I paste all the different panels in. <laughs> and then I kind of go, okay, it fits there and that fits there. And as long as it sequence is good and, and I, you know, and I, I, you know, make some bigger and some smaller and kind of put them together. And then, um, and then once that's done, uh, the next step is either a couple different things. Either I, print it out in blue line on a piece of paper uh, and then ink it uh, or actually pencil and ink it right on that sheet. Or sometimes I'll like with lately, what I've been doing is just kind of, um, you know, take that initial sketch, draw on top of it, add another layer, draw on top of it, add another layer, draw on top of it until I kind of refine it down to where, where all the details that I want on the page are there. And then I just ink it. Mm. And that's, that's what I've been doing around the iPad, which is, it's kind of neat because there's a, a kind of inking it and then drawing it as I go. So like mm. if I forget a detail, I'll just pencil it in on another layer and then ink that detail in. Um, you know, like I, I forgot to put a teddy bear in one of the scenes and I was like, oh, I'll just, you know, add a new layer, scribble it in, you know, in pencil and then go in with, you know, ink and finish it off. Um, it's weird to call it pencil and ink because it's just, <laughs> you know, digital, but that's, you know, the, the mindset. Um and then now, like, with the coloring, I'm getting more interested in, like, things like color holds and stuff like that. So as I get better, as I get better at coloring and understanding more what I want, I'm dropping things out of the ink and planning it for the colors. So it's kind of this, like, you know, it's, it's ever developing until I finally have a page where I'm like, okay, I'm done. I can't look at it anymore. Hmm. 
and then I send it off. And then basically from there, uh, usually what happens is David goes over the script and whatever I've changed or whatever I've messed up or whatever he and I have decided to change along the way, he goes in and um, and kind of rewrites the dialogue to fit. Because mm. sometimes like a facial expression will say enough that you don't need the dialogue. Um, and so he'll just, at times just drop entire lines of dialogue simply because we, you know, after discussing the scene, we nailed the the, the look that we mm. needed for that panel. And then, you know, drop a dialogue or, you know, um, we'll find a place where maybe there needs to be more of a description because there's something more technical about the characters or whatever going on that needs to be described. Hmm. Um, and my painting process is kind of similar. I do a lot of scribbles. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it's very strange. Like, uh, I, I know there's a lot of artists out there who have this, like, you know, you only put down the line, you know, that you want to put down kind of perfectionism to it. At least that's what they say. <laughs> uh, and I, I teach, I teach up at Syracuse and I have a lot of students there. And I think they, they have this idea that you have to have the first line has to be the correct line. So, um, I show them my sketches, which literally look like just scribbles all over the place. And, um, and so, I, you know, basically I scribble until I find the line that I want. And mm -hmm. then I get a piece of trace paper and I use that line or I get a light box and I use that line, whatever, or another layer in Photoshop. So whatever it is, 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 is I'm kind of finding the, I kind of find the, the marks I want out of the, the mess that I make, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to having some sort of like already pre-planned, pre-configured thing. Part of that is also it makes it more interesting that, that every piece is a little bit of an exploration because I don't know mm. what's going to exactly be as I go. No, that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, David Gallagher, yep. uh, who you worked on uh, High Moon and yep. The Only Living Boy. And uh, are you you are doing The Only Living Girl now as, as well yep. with him? Yep. We, we so, have a book called Box 13. Yeah. Yes. How did the two of you get involved in making comics together? Um, well, actually, it, it's a while ago now. It's over 10 years now. Um, mm -hmm. We met in like 2007, and he brought a uh, an idea of basically working on a werewolf western. <laughs> and I was like, all right, uh, <laughs> sold. Yeah, like basically werewolves in the old west. And he gave me some of the story points that he had. And I was like, this is, you know, I was like, I was immediately sold on it. So, uh, you know, because it's like, you know, how can you go wrong? <laughs> you know, so it was like horror, the Old West, mythology, all kind of mixed into a box. And uh, and so, you know, working on that, I really got to, to kind of play around with some different, um, with kind of going away. That was actually the first project that I really uh, kind of threw away the process of working like I would work for Marvel or DC. Mm. Um, because I had inked, I'd worked on a project called The Silencers with Fred Van Lente before, but I didn't color it. I just kind of penciled it and inked it. Maybe I colored a couple pages. With High Moon, I really kind of said, "All right, I'm going to drop the whole idea that there are pencils and inks and colors, and it's just going to be, I draw it, and then I ink what needs to be inked, and then I color what needs to be colored." So there's a lot of places where the pencils come through. And, uh, and and essentially it gave it this really raw, rough kind of uh, textured feel, which I think for that project was really appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, it worked for it worked for you know High Moon in a way that it wouldn't work for say Only a Living Boy or Only a Living Girl, where it's a much more clean kind of animated style. And and so that's like you know I like to shift my style depending on what the project is I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Speaking of different styles and projects, you've also got this uh, this art project called Thornclaw Manor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sort of a gothic. It looks very sort of gothic yeah. art. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what is what is Thornclaw Manor? Uh, well, OK, it, it's it's how do I describe it? Uh, the best description is it was a family of monsters that I started drawing after watching Downton Abbey. Mm. Uh, so I started watching Downton Abbey. And uh, and not that I really watched a lot of it. I, it's kind of intriguing, but I'm also kind of like, I need more action. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm watching it and there were just these like amazingly kind of 
austere characters. Uh, and, you know, the kind of the fun of it was this dichotomy between their, their, their face, you know, their, their properness and yet all the scandals that were going on underneath. So I kind of thought it would be really fun to do something like that, but, but let's, what, what if they were just all different kinds of monsters living in this family? And it, it, it kind of grew out of just, you know, literally just enjoying drawing portraits and then building on, on that. And, and the story kind of developed out of it. So it, what started happening was like, I, I mean, like I said, it's kind of a little bit based on Downton Abbey. So you've got this house, right. With all these monsters that live in it. And I kind of flipped the story a little bit in that the person who has the, the control of the family is the dowager, the grandmother. Mm or the great great grandmother or whatever. She's kind of like an elder being from like Lovecraftian mythos. And she's all watching, all knowing and hideously evil. And uh she basically the the idea is that she's brought her family together for them to fight over the inheritance. And basically whoever gets the inheritance gets the keys to the kingdom, like the keys to everything she knows. But she's going to be very choosy and she claims she's dying, but she may not be. Hmm. So the it started as this weird little story that like these characters all kind of like, you know, there's a Cthulhu guy that's wears a top hat and he's called the playboy. And he, I imagine he's like, you know, off having drinks with the ladies all night. And, you know, it's, it's this weird little kind of like kind of flipping the table on what you expect the monsters to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they, and, and, it, and as I went, they just started becoming different monsters. And I was like, oh, this is like, it kind of made me think of like the old Brian Froud type thing, uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, he's going through all the different fairies and stuff, but then, you know, Lovecrafty and stuff and just some stuff I decided to pull in from different myths and whatever. And, um, and aliens. And so it just kind of grew into this large family and they're getting bigger and bigger. I have like 40 different characters now. Um, and the idea now is to, I'm looking at putting together a book and a game. Mm. Uh, and so that's like, those are the next two big kind of steps for that. I'm, I have a second deck of cards because the first thing that I made a deck of cards. Um, and then I'm going to make a second deck of cards. And then the next plan from there is a game that you can play mm. where you play one of the family members. So there's a, yeah, <laughs> it, it's been kind of neat. Like as I've gone through my career, I've met all these different people that now I can be like, wait a minute, we can work on this part and that part and starting to put these things together. And when I was younger, I always wanted to do that stuff, but I didn't know what, how to do it. Mm. And now I'm starting to learn, okay, I can put these pieces together and I know enough people now that I can maybe, you know, I can maybe put together a game and make it happen. And, and things like Kickstarter also make those things more possible. It's true. So, uh, yeah, what is something you wish you'd known about illustration before you began? Oh, wow. Well, so when I was, when I was a young illustrator just getting out, the, uh, the field was at least, well, because I started going towards comics. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess one of the things that I think I would have been the most uh, helpful thing at the time for me was don't be annoying, but you got to remind people that you exist. You know, you have to keep letting people know that you're there mm -hmm. uh, and be well-spoken if you can. Like when you write a letter, like I've gotten some stuff where it's all like practically un illegible, like, you know, writing from people. I'm like, you got to like write a better letter that like when you're, when you're, at, you're interacting with an editor or an art director, you need to be able to talk to them, communicate effectively. So like, they re they respond to you know people who communicate effectively. You keep in touch, and then when you get a deadline, make the deadline. Mm. Um, and uh, but but I think the and and if you can't make the deadline, communicate. Like I think one of the things that happened to a lot of my friends and even to myself when I was younger was that whole like, oh my god, I'm gonna miss my deadline. I have to hide. You know, because you're afraid of like getting, and I know a lot of people do that, um, because you're afraid of getting like, you know, kind of the, you know, the bad reputation, which of course you're going to get if you hide, but <laughs> you, you don't want to face it, right? It's, there's a little certain amount of, of kind of the fear of like kind of going to someone and saying, yeah, I screwed up, but it's actually better for you to say, hey, I need a couple extra days, like, 
to get there early. You know, say, mm-hmm. you know, oh, your deadline's in two days and you know you need an extra two days. So tell them then or tell them a week before that you need that extra time because then they can plan for it. And then, you know, and then the process won't be, then they won't be like, hey, that jerk just disappeared on me. They'll be like, hey, they actually were really responsible and they got to me and they told me what was going on so that, that I could plan for my schedule. Because like art directors tend to have a little wiggle room in their schedules. Mm. Uh, not always, but you know, they often do. And if they know that something's going to be late, they can, you know, shove things around to make it work. But if they don't know, and you just kind of surprise them at the last minute, uh, it can really, um, it can really like, you know, surprise them and, and get you. To yeah. Um, Chances are they won't be interested in working with you again. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta really be. And, and so that's why communication is really good and being clear with your communication, um, is really, is really important. Um, and, uh, and then I'd say the other thing is that like when I was very, <laughs> I get partially lucky and partially bullheaded in that I didn't, want to get a day job so when i when i got out of college i basically did everything i could to not have to have a it wasn't so much that i didn't want a day job i just was i had this feeling that if i ever stopped doing freelance illustration i would just stop and it would just yeah. end right and so like and i'd seen that with other friends of mine where like you know six months in they're done and then you never get back to it since then people i know have gotten back to it so I was really terrified that I couldn't that I couldn't leave and then come back because there was mm-hmm. this kind of this like warning like that the I don't know if school gave you that warning or there was just some kind of a warning that like don't don't get too far from it because a day job can just take away all your time but yeah. some people need that time to develop too so I mean if you if you you know if if I had known that I probably still would have done what I did but I wouldn't have been so disappointed watching my friends who didn't follow through because there were times when I was like, dude, you, you, you're so, you know, some of my friends, they, you know, they were so good. And they're like, why, why isn't she doing this? Or why isn't he doing that? What's, what's happening. And then, you know, a few years later, they figured out whatever they need to figure out. And now they're, you know, they're, they're doing great. So it was just, it just took, you know, or some people moved into other, other areas of art. Mm. So it was, it was kind of like, there's a certain part of like, you don't have to, you know, just because you went to school for, say, illustration doesn't mean you have to be an illustrator because there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, and so there's a lot of different types of opportunities. And, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, I think that would probably be, you know, keep your eye out for opportunities, look for different mm-hmm. things, be open to the world kind of telling you different, you know, uh, you know, taking you down different paths. Because mm-hmm. I think that actually has happened a lot in in my life that's why i've done all the different things i've done Mm. um yeah makes sense so how how do you integrate your art into your daily life (laughs) well (laughs) i guess my question would be what is life without art at this point um no i mean it's sometimes really difficult uh the hardest part for me is uh forcing myself to go to bed when I'm on a roll and I mm. really stay up all night and paint or draw and I'm really excited about a project because I know because I know like what will happen is especially as I've gotten older and I've gotten more responsibilities what will happen is you know I'll stay up late the next morning I still have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to get my kid to school so if I stay up till three in the morning I'm dead at six and then the, the whole morning is shot with me walking around like a zombie, drinking as much coffee as I can to get myself back to, you know, to some semblance of humanity. Then by 11 o'clock, I may be human again. And then I'm trying to work. But then my, by two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm crashing. Mm-hmm. So trying to keep a, a regular schedule uh, of time. And, and it's it's a growing process because like, I've had to learn to adapt my schedule to everybody else's schedule because I'm freelance. Um, there's kind of a, oh, it's even a prejudice on my part that I'm always free. Right. I always, oh, you're, you're not doing anything, right? You're home. You can just come and pick me up at school or, 
you know, and, and it's even on my own, my own thing, like I'll forget and go to the bank in the middle of the day in a work day, you know, and yeah. I have, you have to kind of like organize your days so that you're not like, you could just literally waste your whole day standing in line in a bank and then get home and realize, oh, now there's some other obligation that's taking me away from my artwork. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's really a trap for freelance because I think if you're at a day job, you go to the job. Okay. This is me being someone who's never had a day job, but you <laughs> go to the job and you do your job. Right. And then when you leave, you go home and while you're at your job, you're just doing that. Whereas when I'm here in my studio, I'm kind of always on call as like, you know, take the dog out, go pick up a kid at school, go do this. And so that's been something that's always been kind of a, um, a growing, changing kind of juggling with yeah you know and especially with inspiration because sometimes inspiration will kick you when you're driving down the road uh. it'll hit in and you're like what am i supposed to do with this you know <laughs> like i have it here and i'm not gonna be in my studio for another hour you know and and i might have i might forget whatever this is that i have and so you know i try to keep like a sketchbook with me or something so that i can write down something yeah. some you know idea as i'm going but uh, that that tends to be the one of the hardest things is is just trying to juggle those two lives yeah, together. The sort of work life balance type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, favorite aspect of art, of oh, making wow. art, of making art. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I can get really geeky. <laughs> uh, I like. Okay, I like it when. What you do to find when when you make a piece of art, when you make a line with ink, or when you put a color down that mm-hmm. defies what people expect should work and breaks the rules, and yet works in this way that, like, like there are just some color combinations that shouldn't work by logic, and if you just do it and you do it right, you can mm-hmm. break all the color rules and make some really incredible like optical illusions and stuff like that that are really and they're they're minor no one else probably notices it um but there are little things like you know you can make the eye you can make someone's eye see a different color than you actually painted because Mm. of the colors you put next to it because we our eyes work optically and the same thing with lines you can use you can use black lines to create uh empty spaces um like you know gestalt theory where you can leave blank areas in a piece, but then the, the black line suggests something that actually isn't even drawn, but everyone who looks at it sees it. So I like anytime I can trick your eye into seeing something that's not actually there or make you accept colors that aren't actually colors I painted at all. Mm. Um, I think that's really fun. Like, and just the feel of like, you know, of uh, like I said before, I really like putting the, the putting pen to paper. So there's a real like getting a brush and, and dipping it in the ink and, and using it on the paper or or putting a, a actual you know a paint like acrylic paint on the paper and 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 seeing it build up and and get this life is just really exciting. Mm. Uh, I think that's that's just just making it is is the fun part. Um, it's not as much fun digitally, but it is still fun. It's it's fun because you're kind of jumping all those processes. You're kind of missing the the textural processes and you're just being able to make stuff fast, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds cool. No, yeah. that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. It's, so, it's, pretty, it's like, a, yeah. it's like sometimes if it's really good, it's like dancing <laughs> with your medium. Like the medium does something and then you do something and then the medium does something different that you didn't expect. And I think that's when it's really fun. It's when you don't know what it's going to happen until it happens. That is cool. That's a pretty cool. That's a pretty cool image. I think. Thanks. So, uh, least favorite. Anything that frustrates you? <laughs> um, probably the least favorite thing about it is, well, one is working on projects that you know you have to do, but you don't want to do. Mm. Uh, like, you accept a project that you think is going to be a lot of fun, and then, for whatever reason, it just doesn't um, I, I did a project for a company a while ago that I was like, I'm perfect for this. This is totally like right up my alley in every way. And then I sat down and started working on it. And for whatever reason, it was like, it was like pulling teeth the whole time. 
And then when I sent the artwork into the art director, they had all kinds of changes. And I'm like, yeah, I know exactly why you have all these changes because I hate it too. I hate this piece of art. It, it's perfectly serviceable and it does exactly what you need, but I hate it. And, and like, there was this like mutual understanding of hatred of this piece of art. And I couldn't go back on it because there was no time. Um. So I just had to kind of keep fixing this, this thing that I hated. And, and like, <laughs> You know, and you just can't, you know, at a certain point, once you dislike a piece of art you're working on and you're stuck doing it, that's mm -hmm. like one of the worst things. You're just like, because because you're supposed to love it, right? Like, that's what everyone tells you. Yeah. You're supposed to love everything you do. And then you're sitting there going, this is like pulling teeth. Like, that's, you know, and there, there are a lot more projects like, you know, deadlines are hard with timing. It can be sometimes exhilarating and sometimes incredibly you know uh devastating physically because you're just working mm -hmm. so many hours um and you don't really have that break time to give yourself a, a chance to kind of uh like reset yourself mm -hmm. so i mean i thought those, those are probably the two things it's it's and they're kind of connected it's basically whenever a project demands more than than you're able to kind of give to it right are you like a, a pressure sort of worker or is a, or are you a sort of a, like you have a deadline and you, you know, work measure in, you know, you measure it out, you're scheduled or are you like, you know, the deadline makes you work harder type of thing? Well, you know, it's funny. If the closer if you get to it. Yeah. I feel like if a deadline's not tight enough, I'd make another deadline. <laughs> so I guess I'm the, I'm the pressure person. Yeah. Uh, it's not always the best thing in the world, but I definitely work work better when I have a you know when I have a, a you know a, a deadline that if if you, there's no deadline I'm it it just it will get pushed because something else will come up. Mm -hmm. um, once I have a deadline though, it gives me something to shoot toward. I mean, you know, things do get done without deadlines. Just frequently, what will end up happening is things with deadlines will intercede. You know, right. they'll come along and then that just, oh, well, I'll get to that next week. I'll get to that next week. And then, you know, the next thing you know, um, it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with uh, stress or obstacles? Uh, you know, when something's just not working out, when those deadlines are getting close and and you're feeling the pressure? Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. I try not to freak out. Uh, I've been doing things a little bit more like, uh, meditation and, uh, and, and like meditative drawing. Like, uh, there's this guy, uh, I forget his name on the Proco site. They have a demo. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of doing these, I'm doing it right now. He's very, uh, loose, um, just drawings kind of just to work out your brain. Mm -hmm. And I'll do that sometimes. And then I've taken the taking walks or doing some kind of exercise. Because I, I, I learned for myself is that all the years of just kind of pushing through, I wasn't taking care of like who I am. And that's actually something I, I probably another thing I should have told myself younger mm. was, you know, um, you can only beat your head against the wall for so long before you start to get bruises. And uh, so I was beating my head against the wall, just, you know, pushing myself to work all the time. Uh, and so, and now I'm, now I'm just, I'm actually kind of enjoying the idea that I can actually take a little bit of time to myself, mm -hmm. even though I'm not familiar with that <laughs> concept, you know, like a little time to like, oh yeah, you know, actually get in a walk or take my dog out or, you know, for a walk or go, go, you know, exercise or something. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when I was younger, I was like, oh, exercise, that's not for art, you know, art. There's this weird, there were these weird like myths about being an artist that I somehow, I don't know where I got them. Like, you know, artists don't exercise probably because, you know, they didn't do sports. None of the ones I knew did any sports or anything like that. So that's not cool. So I'll be dumb like them, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or they were just exercising and not telling anyone, you know, I don't know. Probably. But it was a weird. It's probably all secret gym goers. Probably, yeah. All, <laughs> you know, on the treadmills. But yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> With no, it, it was it was a weird thing because like when I was in you know when I was in art school there was this whole like what would you call it like your entire life had to be about making art right 
mindset. And so I think that, you know, you know, running on a treadmill is not making mm-hmm. art. So you can't do that. <laughs> so for a long time, I was like, that was on the least of my, my things. So that's one of the things that I've kind of been working on trying to, to make it easier to handle the stress, you know, mm-hmm. you know, to make it easier to handle all that stuff. Do you think that sort of like everything is, it has to be about the art mentality is what maybe drove some people out after a school? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of, I mean, I do that to myself. So, I mean, that's a lot of pressure I put on, on myself and always put on myself. I don't know if everyone always had that. Mm -hmm. I I mean, I had had a friend who, uh, who just, I think he just needed to explore more. And I Mm -hmm. think a lot of people, you know, when I got out of school, what I ended up doing was I immediately started throwing samples past Marvel and DC and other publishers and got work with Marvel Comics. Totally like out of the blue. Um, but then once I got that, I was like, okay, I'm here. I'm going to keep doing it. So I kept, you know, bugging people, throwing my work in front of different people, just kind of basically keeping it going. Uh if if I'd had like, you know, some of the people I know took a little bit more time. Like one of my friends uh, after graduating kind of got different jobs being an apprentice to, well, he's an apprentice to another artist and he worked at the Society of Illustrators. Mm-hmm. And during that time, he was working on his painting and then ended up working with an agent who basically said i'm not gonna get you a job i'm going to show you how to work and then you'll get a job so what he did was his i mean and i don't know how many agents will do this but his agent apparently worked with him on multiple pieces before he got a job mm-hmm. uh, to kind of like basically walk him through the process of learn of learning how to get to the professional level um and that took him probably about two years before he was doing professional level stuff um but you know he was still painting every single day he was still you know at it every day everything he was doing otherwise was just to make you know like all the day job and whatever else was just to make time for him to paint Hmm. get his career off the ground um and that worked for him i was kind of like the opposite i learned on the go so like if uh if a job needed me to learn if, if a job needed me to paint I would figure it out, (laughs) which, you know, sometimes doesn't always work out well, but usually worked out pretty well. I guess it worked out well enough. Right. Cause Mm -hmm. you know, if, um, you know, I had a client who wanted me to do painted, this is actually how I got started doing painting professionally is client wanted me to do painted cards for a card game. I've been doing black and white work for, for a while. And, um, and I had done digital art, digital coloring. And he's like, well, we need stuff, you know, that's more painterly and, and, you know, actual paintings. And I was like, okay. And I kind of pulled out some of my old college art supplies and, you know, went to it. And I just basically followed a, I kind of set up a a fairly standard process and just kind of went through the process and, uh, and, and, and it worked. So, Hmm. and then I just kept doing that for a while until I got better at it. And then, uh, but yeah, I was like learning, I was learning with the added pressure of having to perform, you know, at the same time. Cause like mm. I had painting classes in college, but I don't think I ever did a finished painting for real in college. So like mm. when I got out in the real world, I had to actually make finished work, you know? And I was like, ah, you know? Um, and so, you know, there was a learning curve, but mm. it was exciting to kind of learn on the fly too. Mm. Um, that makes sense. All right. Um, I, we've, we've covered a lot. But do you have any advice for people starting out? Ooh, um, advice for people starting out. See, I teach, so I have a lot of people that know starting out. There's <laughs> probably like I could probably fill a volume. Um, if it's about making art, oh, okay. One thing: <laughs> <laughs> don't believe everything you see on Instagram, uh-huh. because frequently people are doing magic tricks on Instagram that you can't see. Like, you know, being able to draw out of their heads beautiful finished paintings. Oh, or, yeah. That's that's a lot of camera trickery going on there. Uh, 
and uh and so so don't don't be fooled by that and don't let that get you down because i know i have some students who that's happened to where they sit there and go well, that guy could do that i'm like yeah well a you're not there and b you know it's probably some sort of camera trick mm. um and then from the, with the business i think be open to different to to the world giving you different options because mm-hmm. i know a lot of people who i've known a lot of people over the years who are like I have to go, I have to work for Marvel Comics. I have to work for Marvel Comics. And they would show their stuff and show their stuff and show their stuff and just never get in with Marvel Comics. Uh Or, you know, or Wizards of the Coast with Magic the Gathering. Same thing. I've seen painters. Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then, um, and what will happen is they'll get that one thing in their head and they won't see the other amazing client you know the other amazing possibilities for doing art for galleries or for you know individual clients or for just different um different types of clients like you know i've worked for you know i was doing books for uh i did some graphic novels for amc hmm. uh you know the the, the tv show uh, yeah and i did a breaking bad comic book you know so i know and it was like where did that come from i don't know but it was, you know, it was totally, uh, they saw High Moon and they wanted me, it was totally different from anything I'd done before. And yet, and and it was, and it wouldn't have been a thing that I have, would have, like, because I didn't even know the show at the time. And I was like, mm. oh, I'm having to watch the whole season, which I fell in love with, but, or watch the whole show. But the, but the thing was that if I hadn't been kind of willing to try it, um, and I've known people who've like just thrown projects like that away and be like, oh, no, I'm not. It it, it 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 forces you to grow, and I think always growing is probably, or you know, at least being open to it is is probably a, a good state to be in. Mm. And uh, and yeah, and remember that the that there's no like, what's great about art is that there's no end point. Like you can always, you know, the there's you can always learn more, so you can always get mm-hmm. more skills. You can always get more. You, you, there, it's infinitely expandable. Um, yeah, you know, and you know, as new mediums come up, or even old ones, you know, find an old medium that you haven't used in years, and then suddenly it opens up new doors. So there's always new opportunities, and I think that's what that's kind of exciting is that if you do it right, you can do anything you kind of want to do. Just may not be on your timeline, but mm-hmm. you know, you can pretty much do it. Yeah, and I think I, I would I would assume that if you if you're you remain open and you build out your portfolio and you learn and you grow eventually those companies that you wanted to work for will be coming to you right almost yeah, yeah. the opposite reason than you yeah. think because a lot of times like one of the things that those people that i remember were like i have to get from marvel is what they would be doing is they'd be looking like you know who's the hot marvel artist right now and mm. they'd be tailoring their work towards that hot marvel artist and trying to make their work look like what they think Marvel is looking for. Mm. Which a lot of people do. But then what they don't realize is that everything they're seeing, and this, this is even more important when you're looking at something like Wizards of the Coast, everything you're seeing when you get those cards in your hand is almost a year old. Mm-hmm. And the art directors have already moved two sets ahead. So yeah. they're not even looking for that anymore. So if you do paintings that look like what they were doing then, you're going to look like you're doing paintings for a set that's two years old for them or a year mm-hmm. old. For them, right? So the, um, so part of it is to a degree, like you do have to know what other people are doing, but to a degree, find you have to find a path that makes sense. And every different thing you do influences what your style will be. Like your mm-hmm. style is not going to be like some magic thing that just comes down one day and says, here it is. It's going to be something that grows out of your, your learning process. Mm. And so the more, um, the more like different things you do, the more things you're going to have as influences Mm -hmm. and the more expanded your, your skill set will be. And you might be coming in with something that looks different than anything else. And that's why they hire you because it doesn't look like the hot artist at the time. They're looking for something that's more unique than that. And exactly. I certainly had 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 situations where people wanted me for reasons I was like, why? Why are you hiring me? And but it would work, you know, somehow. And it was not what I expected, but they they had different needs. 
mm. than I expected. So um, I think it's not, it's 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 good to be able to be open to that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, so Steve, we're we're basically at the point where I'm going to ask you how can people find out more about you and your work. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's see. On Instagram, I'm at Steve Ellis Art, and I'm posting mm-hmm. there, trying to be kind of regular about it. Uh, I have a Facebook that I'm better at, um, at which is also Steve Ellis Art. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I have a Thornclaw Manor web, uh, Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And then I have my website, which is also Steve Ellis Art. <laughs> uh, it's that, consistent. Yeah, it's got, well, I, I try, I kind of recently said I have to be consistent um and kind of made them all the same uh which made actually my twitter unverified because i changed the name to match and then they said you're no longer verified i'm like great now i have to go through all this paperwork <laughs> re-verified um but but yeah um and and then I'm, I'm like so so those are basically the ways that i've been i've been kind of putting my stuff out uh-huh. uh instagram has been mostly the thorn cloth stuff lately because I've been kind of holding off on the comic book things at the moment because I'm still working on the next one. Right. Um, and, you know, so I've been throwing up stuff that's maybe a few months old as opposed to things that I'm doing at this moment because I can't show what I'm doing at the moment. Right. So. That's cool. And we will have uh, links to all this in the description of the video. Cool. And, uh, and yeah. So uh, thank you, Steve. This thank has been you. really interesting. It was great, Angela. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, this is I am Angela. This has been Everyday Expertise. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this interview. Be sure to share this video with friends and colleagues who may also enjoy this topic. Let us know your thoughts by leaving a comment below or check the description for our social media. See you next time.